to introduce Nadim Aslam, whose debut novel, Season of the Rainbirds, was published almost 25 years ago. Nadim was born in Gujranwala, a Punjabi town north of Lahore, and came to the north of England with his family at the age of 14. After studying biochemistry at the University of Manchester, which I'm sure we'll talk about later in this week of all weeks, uh, he set his first novel in Pakistan, A Child's Eye View of a Violent Shift in Society and the Spread of Extremist Sects. His subsequent novels have ranged widely from Maps for Lost Lovers, set in a cocooned urban community of Pakistani incomers and their offspring in the north of England, and The Wasted Vigil, which traced decades of Afghan history, to The Blind Man's Garden, where the so-called war on terror in Afghanistan spills into neighboring Pakistan. Yet despite an avid eye on current events, and Nadim once described the news to me as the most emotional program on television, his novels are deeply layered with history and literature, from the Bamiyan Buddhas and the Brontes to Don Quixote and Urdu poetry. Among his many prizes are the Kiriyama and Wyndham Campbell Prizes and the Lannan and Encore Awards. He has been shortlisted for the Impact Dublin International Literature Prize and longlisted for the Man Booker. His fifth and latest novel, The Golden Legend, published by Faber and Faber earlier this year and just out in the United States, is set in Zamana, a fictitious Pakistani city of 10 million souls, resembling Lahore. In Badami Bagh, named after its former almond groves, a mysterious culprit is entering the mosques and broadcasting the secrets of its citizens, mischief that has already had murderous consequences and is stoking the flames of religious intolerance towards the Christian minority. Meanwhile, a botched assassination attempt by re religious militants on the Grand Trunk Road means the target, an American diplomat or CIA operative, has killed several passers-by. The bereaved families come under Pakistani government pressure to forgive the killer under Sharia law, allowing him to return to the US. Now, among the luminous characters caught up in these complex spiraling events are, I'm sure we'll hear more of them later, but just very briefly, Masood and Nargis, an architect couple in their 50s who have a library with a, with, inside a former paper factory. Their male housekeeper, Lily, am I Lily. pronouncing her? A, a rickshaw driver and his grown-up daughter, Helen, who are Christians. Aisha, the daughter of a gentle Islamic cleric, and her seven-year-old son, Bilu, a child maimed by the US drone strike that killed his militant father. There's also Imran. Imran is a Kashmiri who came to Pakistan to learn to fight for his homeland, but is now on the run from the training camp whose vision of the future he has rejected. Now, Nadim is going to read a very short extract for us first, so I'd be delighted if you do that. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I'm just going to read from the beginning of the novel. So, I, Maya's um, uh, introduction sh is sufficient. Um, so it's as though you've just picked up the book and begun to read. It was a large room. There were many shelves of books, a metal helmet for a stallion from the times of the Crusades, and they were the vertebra of a whale from a bay in Antarctica. In one alcove was the earliest known photograph of a snowflake. The child entered the silence and stillness of the vast interior through the far door. She came past the fishing canoe resting on a long, low table under the window. She was seven years old, and her name was Helen. Two buildings stood next to each other at the center of the room. Each was taller than the girl, was perhaps four times her height. During that early morning hour, the light still only half awake, she stood looking at them. They appeared to be mosques, and they were beautiful, 
with their families of domes, semi-domes, and minarets. She thought of them as two elaborate hats or headdresses, possibly meant for jinns or a pair of giants from a fairy tale. She considered taking a few additional steps and peering through one of their windows. The colors and features were so precise and assorted. The muted shine on the walls and the arcs of the domes. She reached out and touched the detail of a painted leaf. Building situated within a room. <laughs> Normally it was a room that existed within a building, was contained by it. She described a circle around them now. She went past the cupboard where stood the vase of dried branches brought back from Russia. They were from the apple trees that Count Tolstoy had planted with his own hands. Four of them were still alive in his orchard. The girl stopped when one of the buildings emitted a creak, as though it were experiencing a mild earthquake. It stirred now and rose a few inches, breaking free of gravity, swaying a little. And then it ascended further, beginning to travel at languid pace towards the ceiling. It was being pulled up by the delicate seeming yet strong chains that were attached to the tips of its minarets. Eventually it came to a stop, up there in the high distance. The immense room she was in was a library and a study, a place of fertile solitude. Due to its size, it was difficult to heat in the winter months. Not long ago, they had the idea of bringing in two small cabins, each just large enough to house a desk and chair, a stack of immediately necessary books and papers, and a small heater. The thinking was that from December to February, a person would go into one of the cabins, close the door behind her, and work in that pocket of warmth. From ordinary cabins, however, they had become detailed models of two historic buildings, the Great Mosque of Cordoba and the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. The girl had caught glimpses of them being constructed during the previous few weeks. Now they were ready, and because it was June, they were being winched up to remain suspended up there until December. After the Hagia Sophia, she watched the Great Mosque of Cordoba being pulled up by the system of pulleys and chains. Neither of the two buildings had a floor of its own. They would borrow the room's floor when they were down here. So when Helen looked up now, she could see into the interiors. She imagined moths fluttering like trapped prayers under the miniature domes in the evenings, bumping against the colored insides. She would always remember this handful of moments from her early years, childhood, when minutes could feel as prolonged as hours and the days vanished in the blink of an eye. It was Helen's father who had carpentered the buildings and it was he who was causing them to rise through the air, storing them out of the way. She turned and looked at him where he stood at the other end of the room, operating the various cranks and pulleys located near the corner. She liked the fact that he made one last minor adjustment to the chains, making sure that both buildings were held at exactly the same height. He was a tall, bright-blooded man and his name was Lily. Thank you. Nadim, you, you once told me that all your fiction is sparked by anything that distresses me. Hmm. And so I wondered what the spark was for this book. The spark for the, I'm, I'm in a strange situation with that book because I know precisely the day and the date and perhaps, perhaps even the hour. Mm -hmm. On 4th of January 2011, when I was working on my previous novel, the governor of Punjab province in Pakistan was murdered by his bodyguard. Salman Tasir, his name was, the governor's name. And Pakistan has draconian blasphemy laws, and the governor had wanted to change those laws. And this chap, the bodyguard, had objected to that, so he assassinated the, the governor. And I thought that I will write about it one day. 
that not, not one day, but the moment I finish this book, my next book will be about Pakistan's blast me laws. So that's 4th of January 2011. Four days later, on 8th of January 2011, in Tucson, Arizona, in the United States, Congresswoman Gabriel Giffords was shot at by someone in the audience during an assembly she was giving. Um, and that sort of then helped, that fed into the book, into the initial idea of the book. Uh, so originally it was uh, the, the idea of blasphemy, etc. And then this idea that what means are allowed if you disagree with someone? What are you allowed to use? And this is happening today. Look what's happened in, in Manchester. Look what's happened two hours ago in Egypt. You know, mm -hmm. so... Maybe you should tell, because a lot of people won't know what happened in Egypt. Uh, um, well, um, a group of pilgrims, Coptic Christian pilgrims, were shot at. Um, and uh, their, their, their bus was stopped. Uh, some hooded figures got onto the bus and sprayed bullets, 22 at least people have been killed, among them children. And so the idea that if you disagree with someone, you wish to make a point that a bullet is allowable, that then fed into the novel. And then as the years went by, I was writing the previous book. So that, so that was the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you mentioned the blasphemy laws as, as the kind of kernel. That's, I mm. think when we met, you said you were writing a novel about the blas Pakistan That's blasphemy right. laws. So it obviously became a, a lot broader. Um, but just for that on, for, on that for one moment, um, through several of the characters, including Lily and his daughter, Helen, mm. you, you, you show not only the effects of these, these laws, but the kind of hourly and daily discrimination. That, that goes on um, against what you call half, I mean, people who are treated as half citizens mm. or non citizens. Mm. And for me, reading that, there was a kind of disdain that sort of resembles the caste system. There are people who, is, yeah. who are imprisoned for drinking from a Muslim's glass, that kind Absolutely. of thing. Can you tell us a bit more about um, what you see as the roots of this kind of intolerance and also the, the, the modern incarnation of it? What well, I mean, been? that is, there, are, there is a thriving uh, Christian community who are professionals and who have reached the mainstream. Of course, they are you know, lawyers, journalists, brilliant. But I was trying to write about the people that, 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 that I had known and I had come into contact with. And people that, someone like Asya Bibi, who, is, who has been in prison, who the governor was trying to help, mm. who has been, been in prison for years. She did nothing. Uh, just, I think she, she, she took a drink from a glass which was meant for a Muslim. So the, the remnants of it are from the, from the caste system. Mm -hmm. um, and, but once again, I mean, to look at everything novelistically was my, is my intention, has always been my, my intention. I wanted to see to, to show these people under extreme stress, mm -hmm. and then show how are they trying to make a life? What are they trying to negotiate? What, um, to, to go back to these people, to go back to what's happened in Manchester and what's happened in Egypt. One of my most vivid memories is watching a documentary about two decades ago, if not more. It was about, uh, about dyslexia. A, group, a class had been selected, and they were testing all the, all the children to see which one of, them, that one of them might have dyslexia, how that. And one of them turned out to have dyslexia. And all of this was on film, the, the children's testing, et cetera, et cetera. So this child, who was about seven or eight, and he was on film, and now he had to be told that you have a condition, this thing. And he was told that you have dyslexia, and he said, what does that mean? 
And he said, and, and the interviewer said, well, um, you know, when a teacher writes um, two plus three equals, and you have to do that sum, you have to solve that problem, as it were, the other children can see immediately that it's a three. They can see immediately that it's a plus. They can see immediately that it's a two. They can see immediately that it's an equal. And then they do three plus two equals five. The child's face just collapsed. It's, I mean, I sometimes think about it and I well up. And he first has to work out what that, that first thing is. Three. Then he has to work out what that second thing is, plus. He then has to work out that it's a two. He then has to work out that it's an equal. Then he does the sum. And he said, that's not fair. Does that make sense? He, yeah. he said that three plus two equals five, that's the easy bit. He says the difficult bit is trying to work out what that first thing is. That I have to do four extra things. So this is what I was trying to, 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 to select these characters and to show what is it to love under all this stress? What it is to be a brother under all this stress? What, so people who've lost their, their children in Egypt and in Manchester, there will never be a day when they don't have to solve, but there will never be a day when they don't have to get over the fact that their child is no longer here. Let's go to a party, let's go on holiday. Let's, first of all, those three plus two equal will have to be negotiated. Then life comes in. Life is easy bit. In the, in the novel, someone makes a mobile, like a wind chime out of keys, lots of keys and, and, and he's hung up. And Helen says at one point that, that in order to sing, in order to make its noise, it needs freedom, it needs air, it needs to be hung up. You place it on the floor and gravity silences it. Gravity gets rid of the song. You know? Yes. So, that's what I'm about. so that was the intention. Blasphemy, um, uh, uh, Imran, who is from Kashmir, who lives under an insurgency or occupation, whatever you want to call it. All of these things. Ultimately, my aim is to get to that thing, which is the human thing. The song. Mm -hmm. The song. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you about purity, because as, as you say in the novel, the, the name Pakistan means land of the pure. And yet this is a novel which is partly an affirmation, partly a, a celebration of impurity. impurity. And one of the central metaphors in this novel is Masood's father's book. Now, Masood is one of the architects his father's book, that they may know each other, that they might know each other, which celebrates all kinds of connections between worlds. And throughout this novel, there is this shadow book being presented, the nuggets of these intercultural moments that, that have affected us and, and all civilizations. So this is a book that's lost and recovered. It's razored by a spy, and then it's sewn together with thread. Could you explain a little more about this book, what, what the inspiration was, and whether these kinds of intercultural moments are things that you, you go around collecting as well, the history? Um, yes, that's a very good question. And uh, um, I, mean, I, I needed a symbol, um, and, and, and the book became, and the damage to the book Mm -hmm. was, was important as well in the, in the, I mean, I just did a little. So somebody cuts up the book and then someone takes a gold thread and stitches it back up. So page upon page, the cut is different on, on, on all the pages. And um, the idea of, uh, of that, I was, I mean, I keep going back to Manchester, but it was yesterday. And it is about all this. Um, I've spent most of my life in those towns in the north of England, where, where there's a m great Muslim community in Wales. So in Rochdale last year, um, a cleric, a mullah of a mosque, was murdered by a chap, a young man, who, who objected to him giving 
the talismans, Taviz, which is called, which is in, in India and Pakistan, which, is a, which is, has been going on for hundreds of years in, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. This young man stabbed this really gentle 71-year-old cleric. He was crossing a playground after having been to the mosque, and he and an accomplice was, were waiting, and they stabbed him. And the accomplice is now, we think, in Syria, but, the, but, the, but one of the guys has been. So I was thinking, as I said, this has been going on for centuries, uh, that people have been wearing verses of the Quran around their neck or on their, or, or on their biceps. And, uh, and, but suddenly now, the Wahhabis have decided that it's not allowed. The idea of purity, you know? I think one thing we have to insist through all of this is difference. Absolutely to say there is no one way of being a Muslim. There is no one way of being British. There is a, which is what, there's no one way of being American. Which is, there is a clip doing the rounds of the internet at the moment. It's a small fragment, about 20 seconds, from an interview with James Baldwin. And we don't know what the question is that uh, the interview has put to Baldwin, uh, but it doesn't matter. We can guess. What matters is Baldwin's answer, and which is the clip. And here's what it is. Just what is it that you would like me to reconcile myself to? I was born in this country nearly 60 years ago. I'm not going to live for another 60. You've always told me that it takes time. Well, it's taken my time. It's taken my father's time. It's taken my uncle's time. It's taken my brother's and my sister's time. It's taken my niece's and my nephew's time. Just how much time do you need for your progress? His rage is barely containable as he pronounces the last three words, for your progress. That this is how long we have been waiting. The idea of who is American and who isn't English and who isn't Muslim. This is, the struggle has to go on. You know, people keep talking to me about the pre-Trump era and the post-Trump era, which again, you know, in a way feeds back to this area. When you belong to the margins, when you belong to a minority, you know that the pre-Trump era is the post-Trump era, really. I, I, what I'm about to share with you is not anecdotal evidence that someone told someone who told someone else and who told someone else, who might have heard it from someone else. This is, these are cold hard facts about people people in my life who I love, who are closer to me than my skin. If you look like me and you work behind a counter in a bank, let's say, and the customer has come in and they say, we would like, sir, I would like a loan, or something's gone wrong with my, etc., etc. And it's your job to tell them that, to decline the loan, to say, I'm sorry, Nothing to do with me, but I just work here. But I've, I've, I've talked to the people and to, 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 to the manager and what have you, and this, is, this can't happen. Having told the customer this, you are now more or less counting the seconds. When is he going to say, yeah, well, you, you, Paki. You know, this is not anecdotal evidence. So this is... When you belong to the minorities, people keep saying, oh, the gloves are coming off, the gloves are coming off. The gloves have always been off. Now the mask is coming off. Now they want to do it blatantly. And, the, and, the, and the, there is hope in all this, in that this isn't new. Our resistance is old too. We have ways of undermining this. We have ways of, of sustaining ourselves. There is a thing called solidarity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Well, I, I wanted to ask you something later, but I'll ask you now because it, it fits here, I think, which is that there is a lot of rage in this book. I read rage into it. I, as a reader, feel rage, mm. um, and it's not the rage of the fanatic. Mm. It's the rage of the decent people who are enraged by injustice or by mm. the way people are treated, and. 
There's a, an epigraph which is from the late Urdu poet, um, Katir Shifai. Katir Shifai. Um, there is no greater denier of God than he who accepts injustice instead of rebelling. Mm. And that's the, those are the first, first words in the book. Mm. So I wondered if you think that literature has that power to, to spur a kind of rebellious rage of that kind rather than the fanaticism, mm. and also whether you embrace the idea of being a political writer. So very good question. And, and to go back and say that that, that this is the rage of like, like normal, it's the rage of normal people. It's, it's the rage of everybody in this room who are agitated at what's going on. Um, one of the things we have to remember is that the powerful people who are in charge, they not only lie to us about themselves, they lie to us about us. They say, you are like this. We have to tell them, no, we are not like this. Everybody wants power. I don't. I do not want any kind of power over anyone. You know, everyone wants to get ahead. Speak for yourself. I don't want to go ahead. Leave me alone to do my work. You know, they want power. Therefore, they think everybody else does. And sometimes we buy into this. This is one of the problems that, that we actually believe them. And yet the fact of the matter is that Ordinary, decent people, every single day, are, set, are making sacrifices. They don't want to go, that they actually say, say that, okay, I, if I did this, I could get ahead, but no, I have this thing called responsibility. I was in town just the other day, and on, at the weekend, they have those stalls, social, socialist party workers handing out their leaflets or uh, the anti vivis section, etc. I stopped at a stall which was for the National Health Service. They were health, the National Health Service, and they were handing out leaflets. And I put my hand into my pocket and I dropped some pound coins into the, in, into the donation box. And I, was, and I took some leaflets and I was about to walk away when I noticed that they had badges, lapel badges. And I wanted one. And I put my hand into my pocket again, brought out another coin, and I said, I would like this. And I was about to drop it into the donation box when a young man placed his hand on mine and said, it's okay, you've given enough. And I sort of walked away and I remember thinking, oh, look, you know, you've given enough. So, you know, people would think, oh, but this happened to me, and this is how objects become sacred, this is how wells become sacred, this is how rivers and, and mountains become sacred, because certain good things are associated with them. I will never lose that badge. So that's the first thing. To answer your second question, which is, which is about, about, uh, about um, the idea of, exactly, that uh, the rage of the where does it come? Um, I'm reading a book about, by Alfred Kazin called um, um, God and the American Writer. It's his essays on Faulkner, Whitman, etc., etc., and their relationship with God, Melville, etc., etc. It's a beautiful book. Everyone should read it. He writes an essay about Whitman, and then he goes on to write the next essay about Emily Dickinson. And he says that while Walt Whitman made a production of being a writer, a production of being published, and I am America, and my book is America, and, and I am, and um, I am the, I am the American, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Emily Dickinson's nearly two thousand poems, they really, I mean, she had no audience. She she published eleven poems, ten of them were against her wishes. So the, her poems are her life. She wasn't addressing anyone. She was trying to work out certain things about herself. If I could redo my life, I would not, be, I would not publish. This sounds very strange. My books will exist, but they, are so, they feel so personal to me of my way of trying to work out what my life is and what my... But then the books do seem to connect to people. And I, 
And if there is politics, if there's, a, if, if there's current affairs, I gave a reading at Cambridge about a month ago and someone came up to me and said, I love the book, uh, but aren't you meant to be a recluse? And I said, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, no, I, I don't think so. And why do you say? And he says, I, I love the book, but it seems that this is the work of someone who never switches off the TV news, as it were, that it's, that it's all in, in a good way, he said. He, he wanted to reassure me. You can me. be a recluse and, and watch television. Uh, well, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe that's what you do when you're a recluse. I don't know. Um, and so the idea of, want, of, again, everybody in this room and me, just responding as a human being to the, to the, to the really shamelessness that is going on out there at times. And um, that there is a, but then I happen to be a, a novelist and I put it down. Maybe I've said that to you before, but the great Polish poet, one of my beloved, Masters wrote, when thinking about Osip Mandelstam being put to death by Stalin, wrote, you who wronged a simple man, bursting into laughter at the crime, kept a pack of fools around you to mix good with evil, to blur the line, do not feel safe. The poet remembers. You can kill one, but another is born. The words are written down, the deed, the date. So my work, at some level, is my way of saying to the unjust, the wicked people in this world, you think you got away with it? Fine, out there you did, not in here. In here, you will be put on trial. In here, I'm going to judge you, me and my readers are going to judge you, and we're going to sentence you. So that's where everyone else in this room comes in. The audience. Yeah. Now, I also wanted to ask you about names, because names we know are very important. And when, when we spoke, I think when your last novel was coming out and you were working on this, I think it was going to be called, you said a novel about the blasphemy laws to be called 1,000 Miles, Miles by, by Moonlight, moonlight. which yes. I never forgot. So That's right. why did it change to The Golden Legend? And also, um, can you explain why Zamana, which is your yeah. fictitious uh, city? Zamana is um, an Urdu and Persian word. It means, um, it, has a, it has any number of meanings, uh, but it means the world, it means the times we live in, the world and everything it contains, the zeitgeist as it were. And, um, and I wanted a fictional city, I thought I should. Um, so, and in a way, I, I wanted the story to rise above the immediate underpinnings. Though it is Pakistan, it is Lahore, it is. Um, so there is that, and the other thing, the, the, the title, I think the book kept changing as I was writing it. I began writing it the day after I finished the previous novel. So when I met you, I was a year into the writing of the book, and there were three more to go. So, um, uh, so the title, The Golden Legend, I, I found, um, I hadn't yet found that, this title because I hadn't picked up. There is a uh, um, 13th century compendium. It's a Lives of the Saints. Um, you know, the life of St. Margaret, the life of St. Lawrence, the, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was, I think, one of the first books published in, 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 in English. And I thought that um, the characters in, uh, in my book were a little like, like, like saints. I wanted them to, not in a secular way, I wanted them to hold on to certain ideals and then the world to come buffeting in at them the way it happened to all those saints. I mean, they, they were all murdered. Um, uh, you know, and, and, one, and, and, and we were speaking about minorities within minorities. One of the most frightening things about the golden legend, this, this companion, is, is how often rape was a weapon used against women. That 
St. Margaret or St. Anne or St. Agatha, they were told, get rid of your belief, you know, renounce Christianity, and they said no, they were sold to a brothel. We know what that means. You know, they were married to a brute. We know, and they, 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 uh, uh, they disguised themselves as men and entered monasteries and lived as monks, etc., etc. So all of that, when I was reading it, kept feeding into my icons, as it were. So I had an icon representing patience, love, devotion, and then, and then the central thing, which was, I knew it had to be a woman. It had to be the Madonna. Madonna and child. Aisha, Aisha and her son, Billu. Mm -hmm. it's, um, so we have Madonna of the drones uh, in, the, in the novel, and that is based on, um, uh, I mean, there's a Madonna of the pinks, Madonna of the pomegranate, Madonna of the goldfinch, etc. So I thought we should have a 21st century Madonna. So um, this woman who's, 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 whose husband is a militant. And this is what we keep coming back to. So the militant is killed. I show that that's, but then there is this thing called collateral damage. The little seven-year-old son whose legs have to be amputated. So there is this Madonna with a child with no legs. Um, uh, so, um, and the idea of I don't have to I don't have to, you know, tell the audience anything. You can just Google this term called fun-sized terrorists. And this is a, and, and the report will come up. And the report is um, this group of drone operators in the United States. And they say that when they used to see children on the screens of their, somewhere in Iraq or Waziristan or whatever, they used to call them fun-sized terrorists. And so, I, so I, again, this goes back to the outrage one feels. And to think, OK, I, I can't do anything. Uh, well, I can, I can do this. And the paradox is that this is someone um, who thinks that um, this, sh this perhaps would not be published if, if there was an alternative reality. So that was. Yes. And the idea of political writer, I think, I, I think uh, that is what I've been saying all along, that that, that is. But um, first and foremost, it's a novel. It has to, uh, that when I write a tract or a nonfiction, uh, uh, write a book of essay, it will say nonfiction. This is a novel, so, f so I have to make sure that whatever the demands of fiction are, Rhythm, language, characterization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is 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 met, um, and, and I mean, people, half the people, half my readers say that my books are too beautiful. Half my readers say my books are too violent. Well, I'm and, okay. going to ask you about that because it's obviously it's about love and beauty as much as it is about violence yeah. and, and ugliness, and that twinning does make people very uneasy. Mm. Some people. Mm. But you once told me that beauty is a way of mourning the dead. Can you explain that and also your approach to, to the, the meld of, of beauty and ugliness? You have moments where someone in a, after a, a whole community has been torched, they will be walking through the street and avoid stepping on a rose petal. Mm. You know, this is one of the things that you remember from the book. So how, how do you see that that mixing all that combination of the, the two things? Well, I think that, that, that probably is the, one of the philosophical and metaphysical questions of life, in that does the horror of the world diminish the beauty of the world? And does the beauty of the world diminish the horror of the world? How do we live? How do we live with what is going on out there right now? And and um, you know the idea that there are friends, that there is child, a, a child's laughter, that there is love, that there is sex, all of those things, and yet we also know that as we speak, um, you know, dangerous things are going on out there, and I don't think I know what the what, what the answer is. It's a, it's a kind of negotiation and not trying to forget. Um, 
is the answer. I, I, I don't, and I think that might even be an ongoing investigation, as it were, that I don't have the definitive answer yet. Perhaps one day I will. Well, one of the um, ways in which you counterpoint this violence is with kind of islands and moments or places of sanctuary. So there is mm. an island which is the architect, somewhere the architects have built mm. a modern mosque. Mm. There is a museum of glass flowers. Can you tell us a little about those places in the book and what they represent to you? Um, well, um, what they represent is, is a kind of oasis where uh, this is a, an island, and an island like this exists in Lahore, in the River Ravi. There's a um, place called Kamran Ki Baradari, which is a pavilion, which is the first Mughal structure in Lahore. Um, and it, it was originally on the edge of the river, on the, on, on the river bank, but the river then split and so, sort of made it into an island. And I remember going there and thinking, and of course, in the River Indus itself, there are any number of sacred islands. Uh, one is sacred to Hindus, called Sadhu Bela, where there is a temple, and there is no bridge, so you, ha so you have to take a boat um, from, from the bank to this Hindu temple. And, and um, I just wanted to, just the idea of being cut off, a kind of oasis where you can sit and think, the idea which is what I, which is what I do. And, and, and I, at, at one level, I was also trying to evoke, um, there's a movie, brilliant French movie called Les Amants de Pont Neuf, um, where a group of people come together on the bridge, Pont Neuf in Paris, while it is closed for, re for, um, for um, renovation. So there is no traffic, so a bunch of homeless people come together and we see their story while the city is going on in the background. I think partly that's what I was trying to do. And the idea of withdrawal and, 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 and the idea of, I mean, there's an island, one of my favorite places is, um, in Northumberland called Lindisfarne, which is an island in the sea, just off the edge of England, which, when the tide is out, actually becomes part of England. And we think it was the first place in England that was attacked by the Vikings. And, and, there, and there's a monastery there. So I think I was thinking of that too. And, and any number of islands are linked with medicinal property and healing. It's because they are, they are away from the mainland, so, you know, uh, um, herbs and, uh, and, and weeds, etc., uh, are not taken out, they just remain there. Mm -hmm. So there are people who have knowledge of healing on islands. So islands are, so that's what I was trying to do halfway through this hectic urban life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to remove the character so that, I could, so, so, so that they and the reader could just, just slow down um, and, and think. And uh, the island I wanted to also evoke that, um, I've just come back from Palestine. Uh, I've just come back from the West Bank. And, um, 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 Pal Palfest. Uh, sorry? Palfest. For the Palestine yeah. Literature Festival. And uh, I was there uh, at Masjid Aqsa, which is the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And there is a, myth associated with one of the islands in the river Indus that while Muhammad's steed, which, was a, which is called the Burak, which is a winged horse with a woman's face, um, a, a, crook, a, crook, um, a piece of earth had fallen from his hoof and landed in the river Indus and had grown into an island. So, so there was a kind of, so, it's the, so these were just various motifs I was trying to explore. But the idea was isolation. The idea was what can you, should you try to remove yourself from society? Because the idea of self and the self within a society is very important to me. I, I will not pretend that I don't have a mother. 
I will not pretend that I don't have a neighbor. I can't pretend that I got to be this size without anyone saying to me at every corner, watch out, a car is coming. I'm an idiot. So the idea that I am alone is anathema to me. I, that, that I like living in a society. You know, the, um, one of the most shocking things that I, I, I remember is that line of Mrs. Thatcher's, what she said. There is no such thing as society, which is only talked by Theresa May saying last year that if you, if you think you belong everywhere, you belong nowhere, which I thought was absolutely appalling. Uh, I, sh I should ask you what where you stand in relation to belonging and, and home then, I mean, if, if you disagree with that. I statement. think it's slightly, well, it's, uh, it's fine. I think that some of these tropes, some, some of these ways of thinking are actually, perhaps, it's possible. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a continuing process. It's possible that they have been made obsolete or they're on their way. It is possible to belong to England and Pakistan and India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, as it were. It is possible because travel for a certain class of people, certainly us, I always say that we, and is now easy, you know, travel is easy, but I've been saying that for years now that we mustn't romanticize that too. People say, you know, oh yes, I'll see you next week in New York and, and we saw each other in Sydney you, you know, last month, etc. Et Let's ask the person who cleaned this floor how easy it is for them to cross a border or, or, get, get, or to get on a plane, etc., etc. That too was what I was trying to do. That 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 someone leaving civil war and trying to find a refuge. That's where the island comes from. And five thousand people that that we know of drowned in the Mediterranean last year. You know, trying to find that island, trying to get away from this mess called the Zeitgeist, which is the name of the city. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean that I wanted the book to just slightly float off the surface of, of concrete realities and become metaphorical too. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go back to something you said about um, women, because you were talking about Aisha and uh, and and in relation to abuse of women, and mm. but um, you've drawn a, a relationship both in in maps for lost lovers and in this book um, between boys and men beating their sisters and wives mm. and and blowing themselves up. Mm. Um, can you say a bit about what you see as that relationship? I mean, again, I think that it might be that, that you know, uh, any, any number of these chaps who go and commit these atrocities, um, these, these um, not all of them, but they do have some kind of abusive background, that they are, the women in their life have suffered at their hands first. And then it's, it somehow sort of grows up and and the larger society is. It's not always the case, but that is basically what I was trying to think of. It's, it's, uh, and the idea of, of, of women, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, I, I think that women are made to do everything and men get the credit. That, that, that seems to, women run the world, but they don't get the credit. A man gets the credit. You know, it, 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 according to a report I saw in The Guardian, here in Britain, girls as young as six think that brilliance is a male attribute. This is here in England, this year. You know, so what is going on? Can we please just, just rethink some of these things? To that, what is in the air that is happening? And this is, when then, this is then what a book becomes a part, a, a part of your, your, your thinking process. I mean, I was thinking about people are going on and on about, about how humans are destroying the planet. Humans are, when you begin to systematically read about what is going on, you think, 
Look, humans have been around for thousands of years. The planet started going, the conditions in the planet started going down here, what, 150 years ago? Can we go back and see what happened? And then suddenly, humans are not destroying the planet. Capitalism is destroying the planet. Tell, tell us a bit, a, a little bit about your family background at this moment, because I know. Well, why don't you? Well, my 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 family. I I always say that my uh, I have Islam and communism as the twin strands of my DNA. My mother is a religious person, and her family too are religious, and my father more or less comes from a secular. He's he. He was a communist, and he is a communist. And so I got that from, uh, from them, the tension of, and then trying to, it really has been a privilege to, to watch that marriage, uh, to see how two people who are so different ideologically learn to negotiate and, 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 and how that happens. And, 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 and what to learn uh, uh, from from either of them. I, I am. This is slightly at a tangent. I I was just thinking the other day. My, uh, my aunt died in Pakistan. My mother's sister-in-law, her brother's wife, died. This is from some years ago. And. She uh, and my mother was in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen. My father was in the kitchen. And the phone rang. And it was one of those phones that are attached to the wall. So if you answer it, your back is to the room. So I will have to go there and pick up the phone while my back is to the room. And my mother went up to answer the phone. And she picked up. And it was her brother telling her that my wife has just died. My mother let out a piercing cry. And she... she she, she was grief stricken and this was a woman and it was un unexpected. She was a young woman in her 50s. And she turned to the room, me and my father, and said that Askri has died. And, and then she went back and she was weeping, weeping, just now, now leaning against the wall and just inconsolable. And I remember standing behind her thinking, what do I do? What is required of me here? Do I take the phone away from her? That do I have the right to take the phone away from her? That maybe she needs to be with her brother at this moment. That that, but she, but this was just a person who was just just completely broken. And all I kept, all I thought was, if she falls, I have to catch her. Basically, I mean, this is a man being brute strength. This is what I have to do. And. 10 seconds went by, 20 seconds went by, a minute went by, and she st and from the corner of my eye, I saw my father go past me. He went to my mother's back, he placed his hand on, on her shoulder and said, we have to help him, not add to his burden. And he just, and I saw him go back to where he was. And within the next five seconds, 10 seconds, my mother stood upright, she absorbed all her grief back into herself, realizing that at that moment, she's not important, he is on the other. And she began to ask really rational questions. Where are you? Where are the girls? Who else is there with you? Et cetera, et cetera. So, and, I, and I remember thinking that, yes, her grief didn't go away. But at that moment, she realized that this is secondary. And he made her realize that. That, that the idea that we can't save ourselves, only each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so it's, as a, I mean, this is at a tangent to what you were saying, so. Well, I just want to ask one I more. I mean, I was a grown man. I didn't know what to do, but, but he but, did. But yeah. you've spoken as well before about the virtues of, a, of an ex extended family. And I just wanted to ask, as, as the last question really before opening it to the floor, about how, you said that that, bring it back to where we began in a way, about the, the many ways of being Muslim. The difference. How, how was family part of what I think educated you? Precisely that, that. I mean, I have, I counted, um, not, not long, I have 51 first cousins. 
So I have someone, a woman who covers herself like, like this, just her eyes are showing and, her, and, and, and she wears gloves. I have a woman who works for the Pakistani Air Force. I have a cousin who works, who's involved. So the entire spectrum is there. I have teachers, housewives, filmmakers, people who, people who pray five times a day, people who don't pray at all, people who are atheists. So this entire spectrum. So, which again goes back to when, when people say, you know, Muslim, and you really have to ask yourself, what Muslim? In that, one of the things that has happened, again, to go back to right to the beginning, and with Manchester, one of the things now that, as a human being and as a novelist, I and all of us also have to keep uh, um, a check on is that uh, you, you do hear women telling you, and this again is not an anecdotal evidence, these are friends who say, someone tried to snatch my veil and, and call me a name. And who then goes on to say, but look what we are doing out there, what do you expect? That it's been internalized. They think you, you deserve the abuse. Mm -hmm. Then you have to say, no, no, no. It wasn't that you. It, it, it wasn't you. Yeah. Exactly, that you have certain responsibilities as a citizen, but they are the responsibilities of a white citizen, of a, of a black, etc. Et and a whole spectrum, you know? Um, that you don't get to accept somebody's abuse, thinking we accept. And I was shocked when that happened for the first time, that someone called me a name, but you know, what do you expect? Look what we are up to. And you think, who is this we? 